New York City, massive and breathtaking with towering buildings shouldering their way into the blue skies. It's the crossroads of the world by air and by sea and the gateway to America. New York has something of everything and a great deal of something, such as a championship ball club, the Yankees. For the 28th time, they are in a World Series, and for the eighth time, they'll face the Dodgers. But it's no longer a subway series. The Dodgers, once located in Brooklyn, now belong to Los Angeles. start warming up. Mickey Mantle, sideline most of the season, is in good health again. Elston Howard, solid man of the Yankees this year, takes his cuts. Tom Crash joins the batting practice. Whitey Ford and Sandy Koufax, two of baseball's greatest southpaws, will be the opposing pitchers in the opening game. Warren Giles, National League president, beams in anticipation of this 60th annual fall classic. Ralph Houck and Walter Alston, the rival managers, shake hands before they start trying to outmaneuver each other. Sandy Koufax, the National League strikeout king, begins warming up. He set a league record with 306 strikeouts this year while winning 25 games. Whitey Ford, with 10 victories, is the winningest pitcher in World Series history. The umpires gather at the plate for the traditional pre-game huddle. A marine color guard raises the flag in center field. The fans in the stadium come to attention, as do all the players in the dugouts and on the field. The Yankees turn their eyes on Joe DiMaggio and Stan Musial. The great St. Louis Cardinal star tosses out the first ball. Elston Howard returns the ball to Stan as another memento for his collection. Yankee Stadium is jammed with a crowd of 69,000. And there go the Yankees onto the field. The fans are eager for the action to begin as Whitey Ford takes his final warm-up pitches from the mound. Ford fires the first pitch to Maury Will and the World Series is underway. Koufax begins the Yankee half of the inning by fanning Quebec with a curveball. Bobby Richardson is next. And he strikes out on a whistling fastball. And the crowd begins to buzz. Tom Crash takes a strike and is called out. It's a sensational start for Koufax. His mates give him a big hand. And so do the fans. Whitey Ford faces the huge Frank Howard in the second inning. And the six foot six inch Dodger connects with a powerful swing. There goes the ball. What a blast. It falls just a foot short of hitting the wall on the fly. Mickey Mantle plays it fast, and Howard is held to one of the longest doubles in stadium history. The Dodgers are eager to get it forward. Ex-Yankee Bill Scourin smashes the ball through the middle. Richardson makes a desperate grab for the ball, but it goes for a hit. Howard comes pounding around third as Mantle races in to feel the ball. It's too late and Howard scores the first run of the series for the Dodgers.
Dick Trususki is up next. With a one-and-one one count, he lines a single to center, and Scourin stops at second base. Ford, a veteran of these baseball classics, never loses his poise. He takes his time and tries to settle down. But after one strike, he throws a curveball too high, and Johnny Roseboro wallops a drive to right. If it's fair, it's a homer. And it is. And the Dodgers have three more runs. Bill Scourin scores. And here comes Dick Krasuski and Roseboro toward the plate. Johnny had hit nine home runs during the season, but this was the first of the year off a left-hander. The Dodgers have stolen the Yankee home run thunder to jump into a quick four-to-nothing lead. Mantle faces Koufax in the second inning and is called out on strike. Mickey obviously is chagrined. It's four strikeouts in a row for Sandy. And now Roger Maris steps up to try his luck. Maris takes a pitch and the count finally goes to two balls and two strikes. Then Roger swings and fans for Sandy's fifth straight strikeout. And Koufax ties a record set by former Cardinal pitcher Mort Cooper. The right-handed Elston Howard now challenges Sandy's strikeout streak. Howard lifts a high foul near the Yankee dugout, and Roseboro makes a spectacular catch. Koufax once again gets a heroic welcome from his mate. The Dodgers added another run in the third, and Koufax hasn't allowed a hit. Kubek strikes out to start the Yankee four. And the fans begin to sense that this is no ordinary World Series contest. Sandy is in magnificent form. He already has fanned seven of the ten Yankees he has faced. Richardson strikes out on a big back-breaking curve. The Dodger infielders toss the ball around. They haven't handled it much so far. Tom Tresh takes a curveball for a third strike. That makes it twice. Koufax has struck out the side, and he now has nine strikeouts with five innings to go. With two out on the fifth, Koufax faces Elston Howard. The Yankee catcher singles to right on an outside pitch for the first hit. The Yankee bleachers come alive immediately. Pepitone follows with another single to right, and Howard takes second. Manager Alston and coach DeRocher don't seem worried. Koufax is shut out threatened, looks for the sign. And Cleve Boyer swings on the first pitch for a line shot to the right at second base. But Krasuski makes a dive for the low liner. He knocks it down. Wills retrieves the ball, and Krasuski's stop has saved a run. Elston Howard has to pull up at third. But a serious threat still exists. The bases are loaded with Yankees. This is the spot the Bombers have been waiting for. Hector Lopez is sent in to pinch hit for Whitey Ford. But Lopez, one of the fine Yankee reserves, strikes out. And the Dodgers still lead five to nothing. Kofak was very happy to escape any damage. In the sixth inning, Dan Williams succeeds Ford on the mound and huddles briefly with Elston Howard. Williams holds the Dodgers in check through three innings, and the score is unchanged. Koufax still has his shutout as he faces Phil Lins in the eighth, and pinch hitter Lins fans. Kubek has better luck. He slashes the ball to deep short. 
Maury Wills makes a fine backhanded stop of the ball. But it's too late as the ball bounces past Scowron. It's ruled ahead. Roseboro and Gillian talk briefly with Koufax because he's been working too rapidly. Richardson fans again. It's number 14 for Sandy, equaling the record set by another Dodger, Carl Erskine, against the Yankees in 1953. But Tom Tresh doesn't miss. He slams one deep to left. It's in there for a home run. Tommy Davis never had any doubt about the ball's destination. Doesn't have much to do either. Tommy shifts into the home run jog while Kubek scores ahead of him. As Crush comes around the tally, Koufax's shutout has suddenly vanished, and the Dodger lead has been cut to five to two. It's a grim reminder of the explosiveness of the Bombers. Steve Hamilton comes in from the bullpen for the Yankees in the ninth. He quickly retires the Dodgers in order. As the Yankees leave the field, only two questions are on everyone's mind. Can the Yankees get to Colfax, or will he set a new strikeout record? Elston Howard lashes at Sandy's first pitch and lines sharply toward right field, but Dick Krasuski is there to grab it. Joe Pepitone works the count to two and two, connects on a slow curve and punches a single into right field. That 15th strikeout still is eluding Colfax. Cleve Boyer is up next, and he too evades a strikeout as he pulls a long fly to Willie Davis to center field. The Dodgers now are only one out away from victory, and Alston goes to the mound for a conference with Sandy. By this time, the fans are pulling for Koufax, the Brooklyn boy, to break the strikeout record. Harry Bright, coming up as a pinch hitter, may be the last possible victim. Koufax unleashes a fastball, and Bright swings at thin air. Sandy takes his time now with the count on Bright, going to two and two. Then he fires another flaming fastball. Bright swings and misses for strikeout number 15. Koufax has his strikeout record, and the Dodgers have a big 5-2 victory. A milling mob of Dodgers surround their hero. Sandy Koufax is baseball's man of the hour. Besides his own record, he carried Roseboro to a new mark of 18 foot out for a catcher. The 25 strikeouts for both teams also set a new record. Alston and Kovac still are relishing the big one in the opener. Johnny Roseboro is trying to retain the stroke that delivered the decisive home run yesterday. Could there be a happier man today than owner Walter O'Malley of the Dodgers? And Mrs. O'Malley obviously is just as pleased about everything. Al Downing and Johnny Padre opposing hurlers in the second game. Big Frank Howard takes a cut. Padres, who beat the Yankees twice in 1955, and Downing, a rookie, begin loosening up. The Yankees take the field, hopeful of moving back into a tie. Another huge crowd of more than 66,000 packs the stadium. Downing, 13 and 5 during the season, takes final warm-up pitches. Maury Wills moves into the batter's box, and the second game is underway. The Dodgers shortstop leads off with a bouncing hit through the middle. And Mickey Mantle races in to grab the ball and hold the fleet-footed Wills to a single.
Downing picks Wills off first base, but Morey continues his dash to second. Pepitone's throw is wide, and Wills is safe. Much to the relief of Coach Pete Reeser. Downing now tries to pick Wills off second, just in case he has another steal in mind. Gilliam rifles a hit to right. Gilliam goes to second on the throw. Will stops at third. Two runners are in scoring position with nobody out. Willie Davis rips at the first pitch, and it's a line shot to right field. Maris slips as he turns in pursuit. And then falls to his knees again as the ball caroms off the wall. Wills and Gilliam score easily to give the Dodgers a quick two-run lead. And they get a big hand from their mate. Manager Howe tries to calm down his young pitcher. Downing regains his poise and gets the side out, fanning Scourin. After Padres retires the first two Yankees, Tom Trash singles to left field on the first pitch. This brings the tying run to the plate, and since it's Mickey Mantle, Padres is in no hurry to tempt fate. Mantle smashes a long drive to right center, and Howard uses his full height for a leaping one-handed catch. Mickey, shut out at the plate so far, begins to wonder what he has to do for a hit. Willie Davis takes a curve in the Dodger third and is called out. Willie doesn't seem to agree with umpire Tom Gorman. With the Yankee outfield around to the left, Tommy Davis pokes the ball down the right field line. Maris, trying to grab the ball at the foul line, collides with the wall and hurts his left arm. As the ball caroms away, Tommy Davis slides in with a triple. Manager Houck and the Yankee trainer go out to see how badly Roger is injured. Maris's arm is severely bruised and he is forced to withdraw from the game and Hector Lopez takes over. Downing, unscored on since the first, gets a fastball on the outside to Scourin and Bill pokes it down the right field line. It's in there for a home run. Those right field stands always were a favorite target for Scourin before the Yankees traded him to the Dodgers. Bill is a happy fella, and so are the Dodgers, who now lead three to nothing. With Ralph Terry pitching in the Dodger race, Willie Davis smashes a hit to right that bounces off the wall. And he pulls up at second with a double. With Tommy Davis as his next problem, Terry becomes more deliberate. But Tommy tears into the next pitch and hammers a long drive to left center. It caroms off the wall near the 457-foot sign. Willie Davis scores, and it's the second triple for Tommy, tying the record for one World Series game. The Dodgers now lead four to nothing. Padres talks briefly with coach Joe Becker before the ninth inning. Mickey Mantle is the first to face Padres, and the switcher pounds one deep to left center. But Tommy Davis hauls it down near the running track. It's the third time in the game he hit the ball hard, but he's blank nevertheless, and frustrated too. 
Padres needs only two outs for a shutout. He studies Roseboro's signs intently. But Hector Lopez drives the ball hard into left field. Tommy Davis can't reach it, and the ball bounces into the stand. It's an automatic ground rule double. The second of the afternoon for Lopez, the first one going into right field. Lopez scarcely has pulled up at second base when manager Austin is on his way to the mound for a conference with Padres. While the fans wonder what will happen, Alston makes his decision. He tells the umpire to signal for Ron Peronoski. Peronoski was one of the key figures in the Dodger pennant victory. The Husky Southpaw appeared in 69 games, won 16, and was credited with 21 saves. Padres, who evidently was tiring, gets a salute from the fans. Aronofsky takes his warm-up pitches on the mound while excitement grows in the crowd. With a two-and-two two count on him, Elston Howard lines a single to right center. Lopez scores, and Padre's shutout has been spoiled. Aronofsky, accustomed to these pressurized moments, calmly proceeds to pitch. Pepitone grounds to Scour and goes to second base with the ball, and his throw to Wills is in time to force Howard. Only Cleet Boyer now stands between the Dodgers and victory. And Paranoski wastes no time. Boyer strikes out, and the Dodgers win 4-1 for their second straight win. A surprising lead for the supposed underdog. Johnny Roseboro, manager Alston, and the rest of the Dodgers rushed to congratulate Peronofsky. He saved the win for Padres with the same brilliant rescue work he supplied all year. And now it's on to Los Angeles. The one-time Subway Series has gone transcontinental. In 1958, Los Angeles welcomed the Dodgers to its beautiful climate, its booming population, and the whirling freeways. And last year, they moved into their new stadium built by Walter O'Malley in Chavez Ravine, a magnificent four-tiered, multicolored structure. In six years, 15 million fans have watched the Dodgers in Los Angeles a convincing testimonial to baseball's tremendous appeal. And 56,000 of the lucky ones are here today at Dodger Stadium. Jim Boughton, who won 21 this year, begins warming up. Don Drysdale, rangy Dodger side wheeler, who won 19, starts loosening up. The umpires have their usual pre-game discussion. The color guard marches in for the traditional flag-raising ceremonies. Los Angeles fans are tense with anticipation as the Dodgers take the field, wondering whether their heroes can maintain their spectacular pace. Tony Kubek hits a grounder to Bill Scourin, and the third game is underway. Scourin is playing deep for the left-handed Kubek, and he tosses the ball to Drysdale, who hurries across from the pitcher's box to cover first base on a beautifully timed play. After Gilliam walks in the Dodger first, Boughton breaks a curve into the dirt for a wild pitch. And Gilliam moves to second base. The Dodgers have posed a quick scoring threat. Tommy Davis slashes the ball past Boughton and it skids off the mound. Richardson gets in front of the ball, but it spins off to his left and carries away. Bobby starts in quick pursuit of the ball in short right field. But Gilliam scores easily. And the Dodgers once again have jumped ahead one to nothing. Mickey Mantle faces Drysdale in the Yankee fourth. And is called out on strike. A 
full third strike on Elston Howard retires the Yankees in order. And the fans give Drysdale a hand. Don has allowed only one hit to cling to his one to nothing lead. Bill Scourin slams a sizzler to Boyer with Fairley on first in the Dodger fourth. He knocks it down with his bare hand when he can't get his glove on it. And the slick fielding Yankee recovers the ball. And even though he's off balance, he gets off a perfect throw to Richardson at second base for a force out of Ron Fairley. But Bobby's throw to first is too late for a double play. Since the first inning, Jim Bowden has been rough. Willie Davis strikes out in the Dodgers six. Gowron, who is hot with five hits already in the series, also fans as the Dodgers still have only a one to nothing edge. The crowd takes the traditional seventh inning stretch. After Roseboro singles to open the Dodgers seventh, Bouton calls first baseman Pepitone for a conference. So they have their signal straight on this bunt situation with a runner on. Coach Reeser has given signals on the play. Krasuski hits away. The ball goes past Boyer, who is creeping in for a bunt. Crash fires the ball into third base, but Roseboro beats the throw with a hard slide that carries him past the bag. With Roseboro on third, Krasuski on second, and none out, Bouton is in serious trouble. He pitches to Drysdale, and the Dodger hurler hits toward right field. It's far to Richardson's left, but he makes a reaching stab of the ball. Bobby bluffs a throw to third to hold Roseboro close to the bag. And he turns and makes an underhanded toss to Pepitone to retire Drysdale at first base. Elston Howard is signaling frantically. Krasuski, thinking Roseboro had headed for home, breaks for third. He's caught in a rundown. It's a traffic jam at third, and Krasuski is out in a weird double play. And so the Dodgers fail to add to their lead. Gilliam is on second with one out in the eighth. He tries to steal third, and Elston Howard nails him with a beautiful throw to Boyer. Thus, it's a precarious one to nothing edge. The Dodgers take into the ninth. It's the heart of the Yankee batting order with Tom Tresh leading off. Tresh strikes out. It's the ninth strikeout for Drysdale. Don is working carefully now with Mantle at the plate. Mickey swings on the first pitch and bounces out the scouring. That's a big out for Drysdale, but one swing still could tie it. Pepitone, with 27 homers this year, is up next. He tears into Drysdale's second pit. It's a long drive to right. Fairley goes back, 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 and pulls it down near the fence. And the Dodgers win one to nothing. They all make a mad dash for Drysdale. Pepitone just shakes his head in disbelief. Drysdale is mobbed as he heads for the dugout. He had more than maintained the superlative Los Angeles pitching with a three-hitter. And the Dodgers now lead three to nothing in the series. Los Angeles fans are in a gay mood. And so are the Dodgers as they take batting practice. Manager Alston and General Manager Bavese smilingly parry questions about a possible Dodger sweep. Batting champion Tommy Davis takes a few swings. And so does Bill Scourin. Yogi Berra holds the record for World Series appearances. American League President Joe Cronin is still rooting for the Yankees. And so is Yankee General Manager Roy Haney. Commissioner Ford Frick. The only neutral spectator studies his program. Whitey Ford, one of baseball's greatest clutch hurlers, warms up. It's a rematch with Sandy Koufax, who beat the Yankee Southpaw in the series opener. 
the weather is perfect, and Dodger Stadium is filled to capacity. Kofax walks with confident strides. Can he wrap up the series today? Kofax starts off by fanning Quebec. Sandy's wonderful rhythm and leverage are graphically evident in slow motion film as he pitches to Ford in the third. Whitey meets the ball and pulls a grounder toward first base. Bill Scourin moves over to his right and makes a fine backhanded stop on the ball. He turns, takes a couple of steps in line with the bag, and crosses to Koufax, who has hustled across to cover first base. In the Yankee fourth, Richardson lifts a short fly into center. Three Dodgers converge on the ball, but it drops safely, and Richardson gets a double. The camera slows down the action again in the fifth, with Colfax pitching and Elston Howard on first. Cleet Boyer swings and wraps a ground smash that looks like it's headed for left field. But there goes Maury Wills into deep short. Andy stretches out to make a backhanded stab of the ball. He whirls and throws to second. And Krasuski makes a diving catch for the force out of Elston Howard. That's the dazzling type of play that makes baseball thrilling to watch. It's still a scoreless mound duel in the Dodger fifth inning when Frank Howard comes up. The big Dodger steps into Ford's first pitch and sends it rocketing into left field. It's back, back, away back for a home run into the corner of the second deck. That has to be at least a 430 footer. It's the first one ever hit into that sector. Howard's homer gives the Dodgers a one to nothing lead, and he's given a hero's welcome in the dugout. The press box is throbbing with action since the World Series has accorded the greatest coverage of any sports event. It also has the greatest radio and television audience. Mickey Mantle steps up in the Yankee seven, and Koufax gets his sign. Mickey takes a terrific cut at a first pitch fastball, and there it goes. It sails over the 380-foot marker, and that ties the score at one and one. That's the 15th World Series homer for Mantle, tying the record held for 30 years by Babe Ruth. Whitey Ford, who has allowed only two hits so far, faces Gilliam in the Dodger seven. Gilliam slaps a high hopper toward third, and Boyer spears it with a leaping catch. He gets off a good throw to first base. But Pepitone loses the ball in the white shirt background. It hits him on the arm and gets by him. Bouncing down the right field line. Before Joe can retrieve the ball, Gilliam races around the third to put a run in scoring position with nobody out. Ford checks the runner at third and then fires. But Willie Davis is ready for him and ties into the first pitch for a long fly to Mantle. Gilliam sprints for home and scores easily to give the Dodgers the lead again two to one. It's still two to one going into the ninth when Bobby Richardson singles to center to lead off the inning. The Yankees now have posed a quick and dangerous threat. Taranowski is warming up in the bullpen. Roseboro talks it over with Koufax on the mound. In the dugout, manager House hopes for a rally. Koufax and he snaps a curve over the plate and Tom Crash takes a third strike. But the pressure grows for Koufax. Here comes Mantle to the plate. 
The Dodger lefty looks toward first and then slips a third strike past Mantle. A slow breaking curveball. Elston Howard is next. But one more out and it's all over. Houck is beginning to fear the worst. Kofax pitches and Howard drives the ball to deep short. Wills makes a fine play on the ball. Then he gets off a quick throw to second base. It's in the dirt, but Krasuski has it and the Dodgers win. No, no, it's not over. Krasuski has dropped the ball. Umpire Gorman has reversed his decision. Richardson is safe at second base. Elston Howard is on first, and the Yankees are still very much alive. A hit now, and anything can happen. If he's shaken by the mishap, Popax doesn't show it. He jams Hector Lopez with his first pitch, and Lopez hits a slow bouncer toward short. Wills comes dancing in, takes it on a big hop, and without breaking stride, throws to first base. The Dodgers win two to one and sweep the series in four straight. All Bedlam breaks loose on the field as the jubilant Dodgers try to reach Kofax, who started the sweep in the opener and then also was there to finish it. Ford hurled a brilliant two-hitter in the finale, but superb overall pitching of the Dodgers dominated the classic. Never before in all their wonderful years had the Yankees lost four in a row in a World Series. For the Dodgers, therefore, it was a glorious and dramatic triumph, unsurpassed in World Series history.